Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for coming early in the morning uh, and gave up your sleep uh, to listen to me. I hope you'll find it uh, a useful endeavor. I have been uh, doing research in temporal databases since 1985. That's uh, uh, when my first article appeared in SIGMAT, ACM SIGMAT uh, Management of Data Conference. Uh, in those days, temporality was an academic curiosity, and it is really interesting and somewhat gratifying for me uh, to see that uh, temporality is moving in the mainstream of uh, information technology. Uh, uh, that's really uh, an exciting uh, development. Actually, uh, my talk will be uh, somewhat cursory uh, without going into details. I'll touch on the many topics from basic concepts uh, to modeling temporal data, temporal operations, temporal choral languages, expressive power of uh, uh, temporal uh, data models, integrity constraints, and designing uh, temporal databases. Of course, that would be a half a day or a day-long presentation. I'll briefly touch on them. Uh, feel free to uh, interrupt me at any time uh, to uh, ask your questions or to make your comments. Uh, and also, this is a, a very conceptual presentation, unlike the other uh, Postgres presentations, so I promised you that you'll not see a single line of Postgres code. <laughs> well, why do we need temporal databases? Uh, here you see uh, various cases that, uh, uh, that I have uh, uh, cut and pasted from an IBM uh, website that introduces temporal databases. Like uh, in an internal audit, you need to uh, see the last uh, the transactions in the last five years, or a pending lawsuit uh, requires that uh, in a hospital the patient treatment uh, 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 before another treatment started. So they they all involve temporality. Uh, a, a client uh, claims a. Uh, 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 files a claim to insurance company, and the claim need to be processed according to the policy specifications that were valid uh, uh, when the incident occurred. And that, uh, that certainly requires temporality. And here are some other cases, and I don't really need to go, go over them uh, uh, to convert you. I guess uh, you all see the need. Here are some uh, uh, transactions uh, that involve uh, uh, OLTP as well as OLAP. And of course, typically in a database environment, the, the database is geared to OLTP. But of course, OLAP functionality is also highly desirable. It is more desirable than uh, in the past today. Well. Uh, what is temporal data? Actually, our intuition tells us that the data is something current. However, if we scratch it a little, the data really has a temporal dimension. The data has a temporal context. And nowadays, of course, big data is the hot topic. And what fuels big data is high volume, high velocity, uh, and high variety. When we add temporal dimension to the data, then it becomes long data, as suggested uh, uh, by uh, Samuel Adamson. So truly, long data is feasible today. We can store, retrieve, and uh, massage it. What are the characteristics of uh, uh, time and data? Clearly, it is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. And in today's technology, we have the capacity to capture, store, and process it. 
and definitely it is essential for every aspect of uh, uh, human decision making, regardless of uh, whether it is economic or industrial activity, from prediction to analysis, strategy, accountability, etc. Well, how do I see time? Actually, you can visualize time in different ways, and I will propose you a simple visualization. Uh, time starts uh, at a relative origin, let's say zero, and it progresses uh, as the clock ticks, and the current time is represented as now. We can use the calendaric values uh, as you see on the second line, or we can use integers, 0, 1, 2, etc., because the uh, calendaric times nicely maps to, uh, nicely map to integers. And of course, time granularities, we are well versed in them, and the conversion from one time granularity to another time granularity is very uh, uh, well uh, uh, explored. Now, how we uh, visualize time and data generation? Here is a simple example, as you see. At the top, you see the timeline. And uh, <laughs> to make things a little abstract, I don't know why I did it. Instead of using zeros and ones, I use time instant zero, time instant one. Uh, that doesn't really matter. Uh, and events take place as the clock ticks. As you see, uh, event E1 took place at time point 2, and event uh, E3 uh, took place at time instant T5. Now events generate data, and we're able to capture that data. In capturing the data, we have to uh, connect the data values with the relevant time. Here are three choices uh, available. Our intuition tells us that, that the events uh, occur at time instances, like uh, uh, the first one here uh, at T2, event E1 took place. And at T5, event 2 took place. So as an example, for instance, let's say an employee started working at 1 2014 in the toy department. Of course, this is very intuitive. However, for capturing the temporal reality, it is incomplete. And a better solution is using time intervals that are designated by a lower and an upper bound. And if you look at the example, the toy department, actually, the employee in the toy department work from 1 2013 to 5 20, uh, 5 to, uh, 5 to 2014. And of course, this is a very com uh, compact and complete representation. Still another possibility is using temporal elements. The, uh, that was uh, introduced by Shashi Gadia, uh, a prominent researcher uh, in temporal databases. And here, a temporal element, as you see at the bottom line, is nothing but a union of maximal intervals, designating the uh, uh, time of event. What are the data types that we are dealing with? Uh, in a temporal database. Actually, in reality, we can ident identify three types uh, of data. The first one is stepwise constant. That is, uh, an example is a salary. The salary value is valid for a certain uh, period of time, and the changes are abrupt and stepwise. Still another uh, <coughs> type of data <coughs> is like sales that are valid at a time instance. A third type is analog continuous data, like the voice. So in a temporal database, we have to deal with all of them. 
Now, when we consider temporal data, I will use the relational uh, data model as a, a presentation medium. Typically, uh, what you see at the front is a simple table, employee, employee name, and salary, right? And the current snapshot is within the circle, as you see it. And behind the current snapshot, there are the past values. So as you see, there is a third dimension. So that is how the reality evolves. Actually, we typically see it as snapshots occurring one after another uh, at the clock ticks. In any temporal data modeling, the challenge is how we represent this three-dimensional structure, whether it is an object-oriented database, a relational database, entity relationship, whatever uh, uh, data model you are using. So the time you see here is actually called valid time that shows the validity period of the values. There are other names for that, like business time, logical time. For instance, in IBM the DB2, it's called business time. Uh, even the effective time, I, uh, if I remember correctly, is used. Now, let's look at the evolution of the data over time. Now, 1114, this is the three-dimensional structure we have. Now, let's look at a transaction that happens at 6114. Uh, N got a promotion. The salary moves from 12K to 13K. And uh, Tom, got, uh, Tom got a promotion. The salary is from 15 to 16K. And as you see, they are the current values. And if I have drawn my uh, diagram correctly, the previous values should be uh, behind those values, right? But uh, I am not. I was not that prudent uh, in drawing the picture or the diagram. Now, let's uh, continue with as the clock ticks, uh, and now there is the correction at nine one fourteen. The correction says N salary was not fourteen k, but uh, it was 14K, but not 13K. And similarly, Tom's salary was uh, uh, 17K, but not 16K. And as you see at the current snapshot, it is uh, shown. What we see actually in the database is a correct and complete history. Now, if you ask a question as of, let's say, 10, 10, 1, 14, about the salary of N and Tom, you'll get these correct values. But if you ask a question, uh, what was my previous, uh, that was 6, if you ask a question like 7, 1, 14, the values would be the previous incorrect values. So what I am simply telling you is that in a temporal database, if there are two dimensions, at the upper hand, you see the uh, time, that is the validity time. And at the lower dimension, that is called the transaction time, when the values are recorded or registered in the database, you have the complete history with all the changes that allows uh, retroactive changes, even postactive changes. So. In a temporal database that has two dimensions, we, uh, it is called a bitemporal database, and as we will see in the next few uh, slides. Well, feel free to ask questions, uh, uh, or if I am going too fast, let me know, please. Uh, as I have mentioned, valid time shows the time when the values are effective and valid in reality. Uh, that's also called the business time. Transaction time denotes when the values are recorded in the database. And user-defined 
time is any time uh, that the user interprets. Uh, actually, the, these three times uh, have been specified by Richard Snodgrass uh, in early 1980s. And by using this uh, time dimension, uh, he was also uh, able to identify four different type of databases. The first type does not support time, and it's called a snapshot database. So time is handled in an ad hoc manner. The second type of database is called a historical database, and that has a validity time dimension. So not only we store in the database the current snapshot, but the past snapshots. So that is the uh, historical database. The third type of database <coughs> is called a rollback database or a transaction time database. And nowadays, it is very popular, and those are the immutable databases. As transactions occur, they are recorded in the database. There is no change in the database. There is only insertion of new transactions, and that is an immutable database. Uh, the finally fourth one is a temporal database that includes I'm sorry, I shouldn't really call a temporal database. I use the, the term temporal loosely to mean any type of uh, time support. Uh, what you see at the bottom is a bitemporal database because it has two time dimensions, the uh, validity time and the transaction time. And as you see, it is the most complete that gives you uh, entire history with the trace of the changes, whatever those changes are. In a temporal database, I can categorize uh, the types of queries into sev uh, several groups. The first one is a snapshot query. That is the typical query as we know in a uh, database environment. There is no the reference to time. A temporal query actually is a sequence of snapshot queries, meaning that the query is evaluated at different time points. And the other type of query is well known, <coughs> is a time travel, meaning that we want to travel in time backward or forward and see the database accordingly. And for time travel to occur, you need what? Can I give you a little quiz? TARDIS? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> TARDIS uh, uh, would be a step in that direction. <laughs> well, if you really want to have time travel, you need to have validity time and transaction time, two times. Without having two times, you cannot do time travel. Probably this can be the uh, most valuable take-home message of this presentation. But why? I do not understand that. Why do you distinguish two times? Well, why do I dis uh, Because if I, uh, if I go back, uh, uh, this is my bitemporal database, and this is my validity time, this is my transaction time, and do you see the uh, evolution of the database over time with all changes? Uh, made to the database. Well, the next, uh, uh, please. That is, that's exactly the idea, and uh, of course uh, we observe the progression of the database as the clock ticks, and now we are at this point in time, 
and considering all the activities that took place in the past, uh, by time travel, I'll be able to answer the question which was correct as it is known at any instance of time. That is the time travel. And of course, temporal integrity constraints are much like temporal queries. The integrity constraints uh, are enforced at different time instances, uh, instance. Now, how can I model temporal data that my three-dimensional cube in the relational data model? Typically, a relation is made up of columns. And here I have name and salary. And I have a time for salary. And I have a dep department attribute and a time for department. Clearly, intuitively, it should work. But this is not a good solution, right? It creates excessive data redundancy. And also, querying the data uh, would, be, uh, would not be easy. Well, we can improve it a little. We can combine the time of salary and department into one single column, right? Now, this is better than the previous one, but still it is not good unless the salary and department change at the same time. If cha they change at the same time, this would work. But if they do not, uh, it's not a good solution either. So what is my solution? There are two questions I need to answer. The first one is, where do I attach the time? Do I attach it to tuples in a relation, or do I attach it to attributes? Actually, this is uh, a long-standing uh, controversy in temporal databases ever since 19. Uh, 80s. There are a group of people like Richard Snodgrass who are in the category of tuple time stamping, and there are people like myself, Shasha Gadia, uh, who are in the uh, camp of attribute tum time uh, stamping, attaching uh, uh, time to attributes. The next question is what type of relations we use? Do we use flat relations? Do we use non-first normal form relations? Clearly, if you attach uh, tuples, uh, timestamps to tuples, you end up using flat relations, first normal form. And if you use attribute timestamping, you may probably end up in non-first normal form relations. Mason, uh, how are we doing? Uh, do I have twenty? Yeah, you have uh, twenty-five minutes. Twenty. Good. So. I guess since I gave you the opportunity to, to ask you questions, if I use all of the time, you wouldn't complain. Uh, now, what are the possible base relations that I can use? Actually, let me uh, go fast forward and then come back again. Uh, what I have done, actually, I have developed a taxonomy of various types of databases, uh, temporal databases, by using uh, attribute uh, timestamping and tuple timestamping, and whether uh, we glue the timestamps to attribute values or not, and whether we use flat or non-flat relations. And uh, some of the, the relations here are very interesting, and I will quickly go over them as possible base relations. This is a possible base relation. Uh, you're, you're introducing uh, a tuple at every time instant. Of course, uh, theoretically, it is relevant, but it is not practical. The other alternative is adding two columns to a table, from and to. For instance, in this table, employee name and salary, and you have two columns for the time interval. And this is commonly used in uh, tuple time stamping. If you look at Richard Snodgrass's uh, book, Temporal SQL, that's the data model used there. Still another possibility is, one step uh, ahead, is adding time as a range type. 
as a composite data type. And that is available in Postgres. And this is a much better alternative than the previous one. Now, uh, still other uh, uh, candidates, uh, solutions, as you see, the time is attached to salary. Uh, and the top one and the bottom one are essentially the same. You can disregard the, uh, the bottom one. I at the bottom one, uh, the interval is represented as a temporal set, as just a set of time instants. And it is not really a viable alternative. But the top one is a good candidate. If you move one step more, you can put the salary history as a set, and you end up in a non-first normal form relation. And that, I believe, is the best solution for a temporal database. I have, uh, I'd better not talk about this, and you have seen the taxonomy, now it makes sense, uh, right? Here, you see a properly designed application. Uh, there are employees, the departments for which the employees are working, and the salary of the employee. Since the department and the salary do not change at the same time, you add the time to each one of these tables. So that would be the tuples, uh, that would be the solution in tuple time stamping. In attribute time stamping, I would put all these tables into one single non-first normal form table, and that would be my temporal database. By the way, in all these examples, I only have included the validity time, or you can look at it as the transaction time. And if I want to make it a bitemporal database, I need to add two more columns, right, for the transaction time. That I did not do. Mm -hmm. So a properly designed temporal database in using uh, uh, tuple time stamping, I this one is a good example. Any questions so far? Go ahead, please. Uh, so are you going to go a little bit further into why you think attribute stamping is better than tuple stamping? Uh, it's a huge conversation. And actually, uh, probably uh, the uh, slides at the end of my presentation may shed light on it as well. Okay. Now, the temporal integrity constraints uh, of course, the integrity constraint may be valid at one st state, that's a single state inter integrity constraint, or the integrity constraint may happen or may uh, uh, be applicable on many states. And there, the, uh, there is synchronous multi-state uh, integrity constraints, meaning the same integrity constraint uh, applies at different time instants. For instance, if you say that the salary uh, uh, should be larger than $100,000, so that applies uh, today, yesterday, the day before, et cetera, at each state of the database. On the other hand, as an asynchronous multi-state uh, integrity constraint uh, applies several states of the database concurrently. A good example, if you say that the salary of an employee never decreases. So that means current salary should be larger than the previous salary. That's the integrity constraint, multi-state. And uh, an important issue the, for an object, uh, we keep data about it in the database, uh, has a life that I represent uh, life of the object. Then the lifespan of the object that is captured within the database is a subset of uh, object's life. So if you look at the integrity constraint, the lifespan of an object, an employee, that is stored in the database should be a subset of that uh, uh, object's entire lifespan, entire life. And that is 
uh, represented in this uh, uh, table. When you look at the referential integrity, uh, of course, the referential integrity uh, has to be applied synchronously over multiple states. And in fact, uh, when you look at the department, that is the referencing column, and see the time of the department, that should be a subset of the time in the department relation, in the department table. And actually, that is nothing but the inclusion constraint uh, Jeff Davis uh, mentioned the other day. What are the requirements for temporal data models? <coughs> now, when we look at a temporal database, we expect capabilities from the temporal database. Here, I will list some requirements that I think uh, important for a temporal database. Actually, I have listed them in an article uh, that appeared in 19, uh, 1997, long ago, in IEEE uh, uh, Transactions on Knowledge and Data Engineering. I had a paper on the expressive power of temporal query languages, and these requirements are from uh, that paper. The first one says that <coughs> modeling and querying the data at any time instance. So if DD stands for our database, so I should be able to model and query that database at time point zero, time point one, time point ten, whatever it is. The second requirement says I should be able to model and query the temporal database over a set of time instants. And these are called also temporal queries. So I have my database, dbt at time point t, db at time point t plus 1, db at time point uh, 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 t plus 2, etc. So I should be able to query and uh, certainly model as well as query the database at these time points. It makes sense, right? And naturally, if we have the first requirement, we have to generalize it into the second requirement. Now, the third one is modeling and querying the database at two different time instants. So let's consider, OK, uh, see, I changed my uh, slide in the upper two items, but I forgot to change it here. Uh, this should be DD, right? So that's the typo. So when you consider the database at two different times, time t and t prime, and those should be different, that I should be able to uh, query the database. The example I gave uh, about the uh, integrity constraint, the salary never decreases. Actually, that is comparing the database at two different times. The time, current time, and the previous time, right? The salary should be different, and the current salary should be larger. Now, the next requirement is time travel. So a temporal database should be able to support time travel. Uh, the time travel involves the current view of the data, right? And it also involves rolling the database back to any time in the past and viewing the database as it is valid as of that time instance. Go ahead, please. How do you define time travel? Oh, it's uh, application uh, dependent. You can go as far back as Big Bang if you want. 
Uh, truly, uh, the model is uh, uh, very general and can support it. Uh, a temporal core language should return the same type of objects. Well, this may sound uh, a little uh, abstract <coughs> and theoretical. Why relational data model is so popular? Because uh, uh, when SQL uh, uh, is applied on a relational database, the result is another relation, another table. So that's why the languages, relational algebra, relational calculus, they are closed. They, they work on the same type of uh, objects and they create the same type of objects. And SQL uh, violates that a little by not eliminating the duplicates, but we can live with it, right? Uh, and another thing is actually whether the tuples are homogeneous or non-homogeneous. Uh, in it occurs both in tuple time stamping and attribute time stamping. And this concept of homogeneity was introdu introduced by Shasha Gadia. And uh, uh, you will encounter it in a temporal uh, database as you do your operations. The idea behind homogeneity is if you have several uh, temporal values in a table at different columns, whether those different columns can have uh, different lifespans or they have to be defined on the same time period, lifespan. If they are defined on the same lifespan, then it is homogeneous. If not, then it is non-homogeneous and it brings its issues uh, uh, together in querying a temporal database. Ten minutes. I'm almost done, actually. Uh, so we have time for your uh, questions as well. Another requirement is regrouping the data. We should be able to regroup the data uh, according to a different criteria. Let me give you a little example. Consider a table, a department column and a manager column. And assume also that we keep the history. So a department has all it is managers, right? Now, can I restructure this table into a new one where for each manager I can include the department history? That may be a desirable operation. Some use cases may require it. So would your uh, temporal database allow you to do that? How would you do it? And that brings us uh, two issues, uh, unique representation of the relations. Uh, that means uh, 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 keeping the temporal data succinctly without uh, any duplication. And the second one is weak relations. Uh, consider a table. Uh, let's say employee table, employee salary. There is uh, employee's uh, social security number, the salary, and then firm and two columns, right? Let's say employee's salary is from one to five is 50K. Now I can represent this as one single row or I can represent it as several rows. The employee's salary is 50K from one to three and 50K from three to five. Clearly, the first representation is better. It's more compact. But the second representation may occur in querying the database and that's considered a weak relation. The next one is the applicability. I'm sorry, go ahead, please.
Tuple time stamping is simpler to implement, yes. Uh, yes, the other one requires more complexity, absolutely, absolutely. And <coughs> uh, of course, in a temporal database, since we're dealing with time, set theoretic uh, uh, operations and comparisons should be available. And the well-known example for this uh, is Allen, Allen's predicates, considering two intervals, whether they in, uh, overlap, one is a subset of the other, and one is before uh, the other, etc. They all involved uh, set operations. And finally, supporting multi-valued attributes. Uh, all along, up to this point, I talked about single-valued attribute, and we want a temporal database support multi-valued attributes as well. Well, uh, along with the uh, weak relations, uh, there is an issue of uh, uh, coalescing that I don't really want to talk about. But uh, on the left-hand side, you see a compact, unique representation. On the right-hand side, the second, the middle one, has weak tuples. And of course, you can go uh, from weak tuples to unique representation, but uh, uh, you face the question of whether you manufacture in the process information or not that is not available in the database. But I shouldn't really bore you with this. If I want to talk about briefly about uh, SQL 2011 standard that includes a temporal uh, support, and that was heavily influenced by IBM. And IBM included uh, uh, the 2011 standard in it as DB temporal support product. Now, what is proposed is a conceptual range type. Here, how it is used. A table employee is being created, employee number integer, clearly. Employee start date, employee end date, two uh, columns for the beginning and end of the interval, yes? And e employee department integer, in this table we are representing the department of the employee. And period four, E period, uh, E start and E end. Period four actually is a conceptual designation that shows that uh, uh, E start and E end shows a period. Uh, that is simulating the range type of uh, uh, Postgres uh, in this standard. And the IBM claims that they uh, elected this alternative uh, just to support backward compatibility. To a certain extent, it makes sense. Uh, but of course, it doesn't really bring the full potential of the uh, range type. And as I have said earlier, there is a system time, that is the transaction time. And there is the application time, business time, or valid time in the SQL 2011 standard. And here you see the temporal primary key and foreign key that they can be uh, supported with the uh, 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 with these two types. And also, the Allen's predicates uh, <coughs> contains overlaps, etc. They are available uh, to work on the period data types. Now, what IBM does in DB2, actually, is an implementation of uh, 2011 standard. And that is available 
uh, to the temporal extension of db2 uh, on zeros. <coughs> now, there is support for system time as of, system time from 2 and system time between, actually, 2 minutes. And I think this is the last one. Uh, remember, there is uh, transaction time, uh, the, the business, uh, the system time. System time corresponds to transaction time. And you, uh, since there is system time and there is business time, that definitely supports time travel. What uh, I don't like is actually uh, the separation between system time and the business time is not clear cut. It's somewhat confused in my mind in IBM's uh, temporal extension. And of course, IBM implements uh, a, a temporal table by two tables, a current version and then a history version. And in fact, the TARDIS, uh, uh, Manus Agander, uh, implemented in a certain extent uh, in, his uh, in his presentation uh, yesterday. And finally, what did I do? Ah. <coughs> OK, the, that was out of sequence. This is what I want to uh, say about uh, uh, at the end of my uh, presentation about Postgres. Now, Postgres has the range type. That's very valuable. Uh, temporal keys can be implemented. Temporal referential integrity can be implemented. And of course, time travel needs to be added to Postgres. That's the challenge ahead. I'd like to stop at this point for your questions. Uh, and we have one minute, Magnus, or we are out of time? We're, we're uh, out of time. Up, feel free to. <laughs> All right. We, we can continue the conversation after, uh, if you prefer. Or uh, you can ask a, a few quick questions if you want. I have a quick, quick question now. Let's say we have two tables. We go back and forth. The full column here is for system time and yes. business time and business time and system time and two different tables. How would, what's your recommendation for Uh, the, well, the, the primary key, each table will have its own primary key. And of course, as part of the primary key, you, uh, you have to include uh, part of the, uh, in, in by part of the bitemporal, and then you have to do the join. Is the join massive? The join would be massive, and most probably, you will define the join operation uh, when the business time or the valid time overlaps. If they don't overlap, probably uh, it wouldn't, those two tuples wouldn't qualify for join. So uh, in, in a join, typical join, we don't have this problem. But when you, we move into the temporal dimension, since we have the time, uh, time plays into the join, and you can define the join for the intersection of the time, for the union of the time, for the difference of the time, depending upon the meaning of the query. It does make sense. So, uh, I mean, if you did it that way, you would simplify your business validity rules by using the range type. But to have some sort of an attribute on the column that is temporally based, which is a cute logic, but it would probably be the most, most secure way to build it. The, 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 that's true. That's yeah. true. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>